I started working with the FBI three days after 9-11. This is uh, September 14, September 15, 2001. I am naive. I have a master's degree in public policy. I'm a first generation immigrant. I'm a great believer of this great nation of separation of powers and, and system of checks and balances, freedom. I mean, here, I, mean, I was active, my family, I and mean, if you read this book, you, you understand where I come from. My father was tortured by Iran's Shah, okay? His toenails were pulled. He was a surgeon, he was a doctor. Do you know why, Alex? Because in his possession, he had two books. One of them was Steinbeck, okay? So that's what, that landed my father in jail. Uh, so I come from that background. I thought I'm in a country or I have to do like most Americans. I go and vote every four years. Everything seems to be taken care of like many Americans believe. Just eat hot dogs, it's 4th of July, yeehaw, just celebrate. Well, that was the mentality I had when I went working for the FBI. And, and I signed these documents, classification documents saying you are getting top secret clearance. And you know how 20 years, 15 years later, they were so open, our government saying, oh yeah, we worked with the Taliban and Al Qaeda, including bin Laden in 1980s, because that was when we had this big, grand Cold War. U.S. National Security Advisor Brzezinski flew to Pakistan to set about rallying resistance. He wanted to arm the Mujahideen without revealing America's role. We started providing weapons. To the Mujahideen. The Islamic groups fighting the communists received covert American aid for the first time in July 1979. We were trying to defeat the Soviet, so we forged these partnerships. They ended there. I went to work for the FBI and I dealt with these operations, investigations of operations that dealt uh, with the time frame 1996 till 2001, these operations, these files, under FBI's counterintelligence and counterespionage investigations, under those two units, you could see that, well, the Cold War never ended. Those partnerships never ended. In 1996, you know, until 2001, until right after September 11, we were still partners with the same organizations you know, these factions from Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Egypt. And what we were doing, we were creating, and I believe we are still doing that. I have been out of the FBI, but I don't believe that they stopped these operations and creating terror cells, put them in Central Asia and Caucasus. These uh, resource-rich, oil-rich, natural gas-rich region that used to be part of the Soviet Union, Azerbaijan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan. So it never ended. That partnership never ended. And they were working with Zawahiri, Ayman Zawahiri. They were working with Bin Laden. They were working with several other groups that were from uh, Middle East, including governmental groups, including you know certain faction of Pakistan government, to very openly create terror cells in Azerbaijan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and this went on till 9-11 and then continued until February 2002. February 2002 is was when for the first time I went outside the FBI, went to the Inspector General's office, I went to Congress, and these operations, if they continued before 9-11 and after 9-11, that story does not match the story of Bin Laden is most wanted. We have this war against Al Qaeda. By the way, they never refer to them as Al Qaeda. It was never Al Qaeda. Within these operation files that we had in the FBI, it was never. We actually said Bin Laden groups, and Bin Laden was plural. It was not only Osama Bin Laden, there were four other Bin Laden families. They built 300 mosques in Central Asia and Caucasus in six years. You want to see the documents? They are not hiding. They can classify mosques. Go find out who paid for those mosques. And as you said, it's global. I gave you an example with Libya. It's the whole gang. It's NATO going and doing its part, coming out. Go look at just in the past few months which companies have gone into Libya taking over the oil wells and the oil deals, it's UK and US, and then the banksters are putting the bills 
is a team. You are looking at the military part of it. You know, NATO and the CIA, you know, all the black ops and the mercenaries. That's the military arms. Then there is the money, banking, financial part of it. And then you have these politicians worldwide, whether it's uh, in France or if it's in Germany or if it's in the UK or if it's in Australia or here. People are talking about builder for It's a club. It's the global club. And, and the victims are the people of the world. They go take the drone out there, drop in there, and go take a look at the pictures, the one that mainstream will never, ever, ever publish, ever publish. Since Vietnam, they haven't. They haven't been publishing our victims' pictures. And these charcoal kids, not once a month, every single day, okay? Put those, show those on TV. Yes, in full accordance with the law, and in order to prevent terrorist attacks on the United States and to save American lives, the United States government conducts targeted strikes against specific Al-Qaeda terrorists, sometimes using remotely piloted aircraft, often referred to publicly as drones. And I'm here today because President Obama has instructed us to be more open with the American people about these efforts. When we say, oh, we had three drone attacks and we killed three Al-Qaeda's. I'm like, okay, how do you determine if they're Al-Qaeda? Do they carry IDs, badges? Oh, we got two more Al-Qaeda here. Yo, add it there. Is that how they determined they were Al-Qaeda? Or before they shoot them, this guy walking around waving Al-Qaeda flag, wearing Al-Qaeda badge? Come on. He kept emphasizing that these are targeted strikes, but the decision of this happened not yesterday but actually in april around april 22nd and that means it coincides with the decision that the white house made to to embrace not just personality strikes but signature strikes which which means we're shooting drones at people whose identity we don't actually know we're shooting at them uh... because they look like terrorists from the sky because they seem to have certain levels of security i went in there green idealistic i started working and i started seeing these uh... issues some of them were major bureaucratic bungling and competence related others were pure criminal espionage related when she brought the story of the malfeasance, gross misconduct, and foreign infiltration she had witnessed in the FBI's Washington Field Office Translation Department to the attention of her FBI supervisors, she was harassed and eventually hounded out of her position. When she brought her story to the Justice Department's Inspector General, they delayed their report on the criminal conduct of the FBI for over two years. When it was finally finished, the entire report was classified. When she tried to pursue her case via the courts, Attorney General John Ashcroft invoked the state secret's privilege and filed a motion to dismiss the case because the litigation creates substantial risks of disclosing classified and sensitive national security information that could cause serious damage to our country's security. When she turned to Senators Grassley and Leahy to help draw attention to her case, the DOJ retroactively classified anything that any member of Congress had said or written on the case, including material that was on their websites or statements they had already made and had been published by media organizations like CBS and the Washington Post. I was naive. I mean, I was naive <laughs> in every step because even after my eyes were open, as far as Congress was concerned, I was following these issues in courts because I believed in federal courts. Then my eyes were open after that process. And after that, it was the non-governmental industrial complex, the NGOs, the whistleblower organization, the civil liberties related organizations, and the whole dynamics there, and of course the mainstream media. So I just, I got crash education and it contradicted everything I studied for my master's degree in the universities here. After a decade of bringing this remarkable story out, however, Sibel Edmonds finally came to the decision to publish the details of her story in a memoir. What I did with this book was to show people what government tried to do to the American people, what it has been doing to the American people, taking away their right to know. Because as long as people are uninformed, they can go on. They have actually, they have been expanding. So I put in this one book, the book that government has been fighting for 383 days now. They have been saying, you are not allowed to publish a single word in this book. 
my attorneys and I kept sending letters to them saying, cite a law. Given the shocking details of Edmund's story and the viciousness with which the DOJ has attempted to keep that story under wraps, it should come as no surprise that the publication of the book has been doggedly and illegally opposed by the FBI. Edmund submitted her manuscript for FBI pre-publication clearance in accordance with established procedures on April 26, 2011. According to the applicable regulations, the FBI has 30 days to review the submission. Over one year later, the FBI still has yet to comply with the law and clear the book. This is not a mainstream book. This book, nobody can see it in bookstores. You know why? Because the top tier publishers, they said, oh, we believe it will sell very good, but we're not going to touch this. At this point, this case is still in some ways hot. We don't want to be in the wrong side of the FBI. Another publisher said, you know, American people, they, they like to read on, in political books like this, one side or another. It's either Republican or if it's Democrat. You're coming and trashing all of them, saying they're all corrupt, they're all awful. In the end, Sibel Edmonds made the decision to self-publish her memoir, Classified Woman, The Sibel Edmonds Story, for the precise same reasons that she started the Boiling Frogs Post website. Because the technology and the means to do so are in the grasp of the ordinary citizen, perhaps for the first time in human history, and because all of her experience has proven that waiting for someone else to come along and tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, is a futile endeavor. The most important thing is, what is our government doing? What has it been doing? And why they have been covering up what they have been doing for so long? Because, you know, if you're not engaged in something really wrong, outrageous, you won't have this need to cover up. You won't have to classify five million documents every single day. Hey, that's what they do. The so-called liberal president that has convicted seven, seven government whistleblowers, their crime, coming out, letting the pub public know that their government is engaged in criminal activities all over the world and here in the United States. And you know what, when you and I say this, Alex, not cases. Conspiracy theorist Alex Jones was interviewing conspiracy nutcases about Edmonds. They call us the radicals, the nutcases. The, these are the, uh, oh, these are the marginal people. Uh, there are 9-11 crooks. Oh, the other one is a conspiracy theorist. They have now put millions of Americans in this bucket. And the number is increasing. The number that our government and our media designate as nutcases conspiracy theories. That's what we are, millions of us. We are being persecuted. We are being marginalized. We just sit and take it. Every day is going to get worse. Today, They started by having us remove our shoes out. As a nation, we are being raped every day. That TSA is only one, as you said. What they do in schools, that's another way. What they do, you are talking on the phone and they are listening to you. Everybody now knows it, but they stopped screaming about it when NSA's illegal eavesdropping of all American communication came out. Six months later, it became a fact of life. They, they rape your privacy on the phone. They rape your privacy on the email. They rape your daughter in the airport. They rape your son in schools. How long are you going to sit and put up with being raped? And every month, like good little sheep, go and pay your taxes and say, I give you the money, rape me, please. And when people say, you're going to stop this, get their pitchfork, get out there and say, we've had it.